July, bluefin tuna again are striking in the waters off Nova Scotia. In October, they will have disappeared. Where do they come from? No one knows exactly. Nor does anyone know the habits of this deep sea fish. The bluefin tuna is widely distributed, found in the Pacific, the Mediterranean, and Atlantic waters. Some migrate along the west coast of Europe in the late fall and winter. Then following the Gulf Stream, they strike the West Indies in the spring. Traveling through Caribbean waters, spawn somewhere in this area. Following the mackerel and herring on which they feed, they head north along the eastern coast of the United States and Canada and strike Nova Scotia near Yarmouth and Wedgeport about the 1st of July. Wedgeport is typical of many fishing villages with its church, its schoolhouse, its cooperative store. It is peopled by Leblanc, Boudreaux, Doucettes, and other descendants of the Acadian French who settled here in 1770. People who still follow the ways of the sea as their forefathers did. It is a leisurely village where there is time to stop and talk to a neighbor. Here, harvests are more plentiful from the sea than from the land. For Wedgeport, as its name suggests, is located on a point of land wedged between the sea and Tuscott River. It is the sea and the giant tuna sporting in the waters just offshore that make Wedgeport a unique village. In Soldier's Rip, a strong tidal stream, about one mile wide, great schools of tuna feed amongst the rocky Tuscan Islands. Tuna throng here. So hungry for food, they destroy nets and food fish. To rid the waters of them, the Wedgeport fishermen rigged up boats for harpooning. They drifted in the bay watching for tuna to surface. They harpooned and sold them in the commercial markets, but never considered catching them with rod and reel for sport, as they did in other waters off Nova Scotia. It was in 1935 that Mike Lerner, ever on the hunt for new tuna fishing grounds, angled here with bait. The fish grabbed hungrily, and he had strike after strike. Almost overnight, Wedgeport became news. The village boats were not at all equipped for sport fishing, and the demand for suitable boats was great. So the fishermen overhauled and reinstalled their engines. They organized a tuna fleet of boats with themselves as guides and captains. And they painted their boats to match the sky, to make them less noticeable from a fish-eye view. The inn soon filled with people, and today, all summer long, at Wedgeport, traffic leads to Tuna Wharf. Where sportsmen gather around the clubhouse. In the evening, strangers become friends as they talk of tuna they have caught in other places. Yarns stop early because these deep sea anglers must be up before dawn.
In the home of the guides, Mrs. Richard is already getting breakfast. Edward is a captain and owns one of the tuna boats. And George, one of his crew, is a guide. At the inn, the guests are getting a good breakfast too. Pettis is still talking of the tuna he hopes to land. And John Manning is here again, hoping to beat his official record of 1938 when he pulled in a tuna weighing 890 pounds. These giant blue fins bring sport fishermen from all over the world to Nova Scotia, and for them, the day begins while others sleep. It is an hour's run out through Lobster Bay to Soldier's Rip, and on the way out, the crew is busy getting the gear ready. This morning, other boats have beaten Manning to the fishing grounds. Often, it is a race to see who will be on the rips first. For tuna feed better on the early tide, and it's a thrill to get the first strike. Herring boats on their way home from all night fishing come alongside to supply the tuna boats with fresh bait, for each boat uses an average of two barrels each day. Herring is most commonly used, although mackerel also makes a good bait. Getting the bait ready is quite a delicate job, for it must look as lifelike as possible as it drifts behind the boat. The backbone is removed, so the bait will wiggle naturally in the water. The hook is then threaded through the mouth into the body of the fish, and the eye of the hook is sewn into the mouth. Now the bait will glide through the water with a swimming action. The fishermen use 24 or 36 thread line. This is fastened to the leader with a snap swivel to prevent kinking. The leader, made of piano wire, is about 20 feet long. To allow freedom of action, the rod is placed in a socket in the swivel chair at the stern of the boat. Some boats have a second rod in the stern. This rod usually has a string of herring tied on its lead.